customize it to suit our needs. So let's start with the design phase. Basically in any product design phase, our variables are our product and we need to know the knowledge about the product and its end users. If we are making an application, we need to know what we intend to do with that application, who we are targeting it at. Are we targeting it at kids? Are we targeting it at 60 plus people? Are we targeting it at just uh, women? So these are our variables. We need to know what our product wants to do and who's going to use it. We need to have a skeleton of the requirements ready. So it's not like it's out of the air, it's in my mind and I want to implement it. I should have some kind of a template design ready, which is like a skeleton that this is what my product is going to look like and this is what I want my product to do. This is where my application is going to go and this is the kind of users I want my uh, product to be downloaded by. And I, didn't, I need to identify my use cases, which are my important use cases. This is specifically important in the case of service-based applications like, um, like travel applications or like Nokri, Make My Trip, uh, India Times. This is important. Use, identifying the use cases is more becomes more important in these kind of applications than in mobile applications like uh, maybe games or entertainment apps or themes. There the use cases are not so important. There what becomes important is the end user. Here are the use cases. But yes, my variables therefore become my end user or demographics the requirements and the use cases and what are as a, as the end product of the product design phase i need the first version of the product design which is what i said is the skeleton now a common mistake that most people tend to do is start the scheduling before you have a design in hand that's not what we should be doing we have the product design created, we have a skeleton of the requirements from our product and then we start shooting it. Now once the design is ready, like I said, we start the scheduling. The first thing we need to do is create the work breakdown structure or what we popularly know as the WBS for all the tasks. And here I mean all tasks, every small and big task. Do not exclude anything, even if it means resource, uh, you know, resourcing some hardware or something like that. We do not ignore those. Put everything into your WPS. Organize all the tasks that we have made into phases. For example, graphics and UI is one phase, creation of graphics and UI. The Next phase is development, then we have a phase for unit testing, then we have a phase for testing and QA. Once we have done organizing them into phases, after that we start identifying the critical tasks in each phase. Now one popular mistake that most people try to do is, and what is also addressed by agile methodology is that we try to ignore the smaller tasks and just focus on the critical tasks. Now doing this kind of a thing, that's not wrong, but doing this kind of a thing allows you to focus on the critical tasks because you've identified the critical tasks in each phase and you set up your milestones around them. But at the same time, in the background, you still have your smaller tasks which are equally important, but which should not become the focus. So you know everything you need to do and then you can sit and concentrate on each of the tasks, each of the critical tasks. And yes, these phases can overlap. It's not like once graphics are done, only then I can start development. Once development is done, only then I can start testing and put it into QA. I can overlap these. For example, I have some set of graphics ready for one screen size. I can put it into development and I keep doing the graphics for the remaining screen sizes. Same thing for development. I can you know, just do one screen size, 
put it into testing and then I keep working on the other screen sizes. Meanwhile, my testing team can keep testing the uh, flow for one screen size because after that it's more of a resource manipulation. So these phases can overlap and we can optimize on a lot of time using overlap of phases. So continuing with scheduling, once we've done the work breakdown structure, identified our critical tasks, what we do is then we gather our team around for a assessment on the WBS. It's not like if you created a work breakdown structure, it's going to be the absolute defining thing for your product, for your project. You never do things by yourself. Gather your team around you, assign a rough time frame to each of the tasks in consultation with them and the responsible resources. More than telling them, it should be getting it from them, how they're going to do things. So we do not attempt to schedule all by ourselves. We need to involve the whole team and then create the schedule. And then set up the task milestones and checkpoints. And one important thing that we must do is keep sufficient buffer because there are always surprises, surprise activities that are going to keep coming in. So keep sufficient buffer for every task. Okay, this is a sample WBS uh, for the design phase in any mobile applications project plan, wherein you would need to create a detailed design, create the screen prototypes, create the graphics around it, create the content, and create the technical design. Now, if you look at this WBS very carefully, one important thing that is present after every creation is a review. And review is one thing that most of us miss out because while doing mobile applications, we're always so crunched for time that we just tend to say, it's okay, I'll do the reviews later. And that later never comes. So it's very important to concentrate on the review. In fact, I would say that review is probably more important than actually creating any of these components because a lot more comes out in reviews. So make sure you do a review of every step after every step. So summing up our scheduling uh, pr uh, phase, our variables in this phase were the WBS, all the tasks that are present in the uh, in the in each of the phases and the timelines as defined by the product team. If, if let's say your product team wants some release to be put out at a certain event, let's say Diwali was just here and you want to do something around Diwali. So that's a timeline which is given by the product. It's not something you give it to them. So for every uh, application, every product, every release, the product team is also going to define some kind of a timeline. So your variables therefore become the tasks and the timelines. And of course, the constraints in the scheduling phase still remain your uh, costs and your resources. At the end of the scheduling phase, you should have the first version of the project plan ready. Why I say a first version is because your project plan is bound to change once you actually get into the uh, development mode. So this is the first version which we should keep it flexible to be uh, updated in the next phase. Once we have the scheduling done, we start with the actual execution. So the input to the execution phase becomes your project plan which goes to the development team. The development team works on it works on the product, then it goes into a peer review, the peer review by the product team. Peer review in normal Java practices or normal coding practices is a code review by your peers. Here by peer review I mean the product peer review, where if you're doing an application, you run the application on your handset and see if it is working. The product team 
peer review is very important because they are bound to give you some changes after that. Unless you're doing a services-based app where you're actually just scaling down from the internet onto your handheld device, you are bound to get changes in the product that you show it to them after the first iteration of development. So once peer review by product is done, you revisit the product design, see if you want to make any changes into it, if there were any peer review comments by the product team. Then if those comments are something that are going to actually require more development effort and more time, then you, need, you might even need to rework the plan a little. And this iteration would go on till the product team is satisfied with the product they have in hand. Now, in the beginning of starting to explain all of this, I said that we need to have the design as an input into the, into the iterations. Now, theoretically, iteration-based model does not you know, stringently say that we need to have a design ready. This is something that we generally do. The reason being, it kinds of puts an upper uh, limit on the number of iterations needed because if you have like 80% of your design thought out in your mind then the there are it's it's seen in practice that you won't be coming with uh, you won't be getting back too many comments for change from the product team but if you try to iterate a lot on design itself then you will just be stuck in this iteration cycle for god knows how how long so once the, uh, so it, it always helps to have some kind of a design ready before you enter into this loop of iterations of development. Once the product is satisfied with the, uh, once the product team is satisfied with the product they have in hand, it goes into testing and QA. So our variables in the execution step are the product review, uh, uh, product app review comments. And the end product would be the final binaries, which are through, which have been put through peer review as well as code review. So the final binaries are sent to the testing team, and we enter into the testing and QA phase of our development cycle, product development cycle. Now testing in QA is uh, something that the mobile that in the mobile applications industry it has not been exploited too much till now. It's a common mistake to actually ignore or you know, not give in, in, enough importance to the testing. So it gets really less attention than what it should. So that is a reason that if you if you see like 10,000 or 100,000 apps on the App Store today when you download them, you will find just two or three of them which you want to actually play, play or use. So now why is it that this happens? Why is it that testing actually gets less attention than what it should? There is, there are two, there are actually seven uh, constraints to it, out of which three are the most, three is what we consider as very important. One is the time constraint because of a huge amount of release pressure. There's a lot of there's more focus on engineering and the UI design part of it than actually testing out the end product. Once you're done, once you have the binary in hand, most of the times you just do a kind of sanity. Okay, I download it, run it, run it, run it on all the number of devices I've got, and put it out. If it's running fine, it's not crashing fine, I put it out. I'm not actually going to go through all the flows in my application, go back and forth between screens, try all pop-ups, try all interfaces and services that it might link to before actually putting it out. So this is one major reason why uh, testing is often ignored. The second is the lack of standard guidelines and automated tools for mobile app testing. Uh, there are no set guidelines for the kind of testing practices that should be followed for mobile application testing. We have a couple of automated tools that have come in now, but either because of the cost or whatever, they're not 
still used so extensively. And the third most important reason is the availability of devices. Now, a lot of app publishers are actually standalone entities or, you know, a small team of five getting together. So, getting access to the large range of devices that are available in the market, whether you want to you want to develop for iOS or whether you want to do it for Android or you want to do it for Symbian, the number of devices is huge. So it's not really possible to get every device and test it out on it. You might use simulators and stuff, but then again, that involves putting in a lot of money into developing the simulators or getting the simulators from there. So those contacts. So for standalone uh, independent developers, this becomes a very big constraint, testing. So that's one reason that effective testing, even if they want to do it, they are not able to do it. So, and one more thing that we feel is uh, is a constraining factor is that uh, we try to apply the traditional uh, test plans to mobile applications, which is not uh, which is not the right thing to do because you do not want to concentrate on every screen, <coughs> every screen, every element in every screen. You want to test it, but at times, this this kind of testing runs the risk of actually missing out to test the functionality. Like you know, if you if you're playing a word game, for example, you need to check if after playing 50 times, 50 words, is my app still behaving the way it should? Or you know, if I'm playing say 200 words, am I still getting the same uh, kind of scores? Am I still getting the same achievements? Am I still going to the same services, am I still going on to Facebook or whatever. It's something that we're not able to do because if I follow my traditional test plan, they're going to tell me test the screen, test the screen, then go to this screen, check the flow. It's not going to tell me test it 100 times or test it 200 times. So we try to, if we try to apply the traditional practices, then also we have a problem and if we try to do a, just a sanity kind of testing, that's also a problem. So we need to find a middle way somewhere. And since there is a, there's, there's no standard guidelines for mobile app testing, this is something that uh, you need to put thought into. And since we are constrained by time, we just don't do it. So it's, it's, it's kind of a cycle and eventually it's the quality of the app that suffers at the hands of it. So how we handle QA will be decided by the type of applications we are doing. Are we doing uh, service-based apps? Are we doing utility apps? I may, I may be doing just a bedside talk for my iPad. So it's a simple app it's, which does not require too much of uh, UI effort. So is it like that or is it utilities or is it uh, some kind of gaming application which is you know heavy graphics and a lot of sounds and effects and the scale of the applications how many platforms am I going to how many users can I handle at the same time so how we want to handle QA how we want to test out our products is decided by these two factors and of course there's no best way like I said there's no defined practices so we have the liberty to choose the model that works best for us. So that's, that's a very big advantage actually. 